Hey guys, got an awesome show for you today on the podcast. I am talking to Wania Tebow. Wania is the only female to ever win the Alone series uh, on the History Channel. Uh, she was also on Alone Frozen and she was out in the wilderness for 73 days. She is a beast. But today we are talking about her new book, Never Alone. Uh, you're going to really love this conversation. She is such an inspiration and uh, she is just the epitome of you can do whatever you set your mind to and you really have no limitations. Um, really fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Check out her book, Never Alone, and check out her appearance on the Alone series. All right, guys. Now, before we go to the show, a brief word from our sponsor. So, on OSIOnline.com, you can check out the Daily 21's program. And you might be thinking, why would I want to check out the Daily 21's program? And the answer is, is because you could learn how to feel amazing in your own body in just 21 days. So, this is a daily program, 21 days in a row, that you participate in a series of movements for 21 reps at a time. And the idea is that these movements start to help your body remember how it's designed to move and let go of all the compensations and limitations that you might be experiencing right now. So if you feel tight, achy, stiff, or you just can't move as good as you used to, the Daily 21's program is your key to unlock your body so that you feel amazing. Now, what do you do after 21 days? Well, honestly, guys, it just feels so good. You just, you just keep doing it. And it's too easy. It's too easy not to do and it's, it would be just ridiculous to stop because you feel so good. You feel amazing in your own body. So go on down to OSIOnline.com and check out the Daily 21's program. All right, now back to the show. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. So Juanita, I know this is going to sound weird, but I knew absolutely nothing about the Alone TV show. Um, I found out about you from my friend Sarah, who read your book, and wow. then... And then she told me about you and then I read your book. Um, so I'm kind of coming at this from a, a now, now I need to watch the alone series, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't watched it yet. Well, I actually love that. I love the idea that the book is standalone and might get you curious enough to watch the show. And then the show backs up the book rather than the other way around. Cause I prefer my version. Well, and so I only know your version, which I, I'm, it's, it's a very, it's like, it's good. Like it, I mean, it sucked me in where I'm like, I mean, I, I know you probably reject this notion, but to me, well, I mean, it's you're just you're really like a real life uh, superhero. Like you have special abilities and powers that most people just don't have or don't even imagine uh, having. Well, part of my premise and the reason why it felt important to write the book was that I really want people to recognize the fact that we all have those same superpowers, but they're latent within most of us, right? Like if our ancestors hadn't been able to do everything that I did on alone, none of us would be here. But our modern lives have kind of divorced us from that capacity. And so we feel like they're so inaccessible to us. But when we learn some of the basics and put ourselves out in that situation, then all of this stuff comes forth and we find that we're more capable than we ever would have given ourselves credit for. Yeah. Yes, you are just that right there. You're so uh, motivational, inspirational. Um, and I, I got to tell you, too. So now that I know just a little bit more about the Alone show, like what you did is phenomenal, but you've done it twice, <laughs> which is that that's beyond mind bending for me. Like, I, why, why, I don't even know why you would want to do it twice. But I mean, I guess I do read your story, but that's just amazing. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's really what's really interesting to me is how different each journey was. And I mean, I learned so much the first time and that really informed a lot about my second experience. But I went into this second experience really expecting it to be similar to the first time. And it was just night and day different. And that was really hard. That was probably the hardest thing for me about the second time was the expectations I had going in. And I mean, Labrador really handed me my butt in the ways that the Arctic didn't. So um, I'm really excited to write the second book and and oh, show the alert. contrast and the whole arc of the entire journey. That will, yeah, I, I look forward to that. So for, the, for those of you listening, and I'm sure everyone knows this but me, but Juanilla was in the wilderness in Canada, almost well, in the Arctic um, for 73 days. 
mm-hmm. by herself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and no camera crew, just us dropped in the wilderness with 10 items and a box full of camera equipment. And I wouldn't, I know you, how would you describe yourself? Not a survivor, but like, you're definitely a thriver, right? That, that is a term that I use these days. You know, I never came at all of these skills from a survival perspective. I feel like survivalism and the whole concept of survival is really fear-based. It's based on the idea that the natural world is our enemy, that it's out to get us, and it's all we can do just to not die out there. So my perspective is that we come from the wilderness. We're actually well adapted to live in the wilderness and that it's about relearning what it is to really be human, right? Because everything about our bodies, our neurology, our senses is geared towards being in deep connection with the natural world. It's not built for, you know, climate controlled boxes like this one. So to me, I'm, I refer to myself more as a wilderness living instructor or ancestral skills rather than survival teacher. But because of the alone shows, a lot of people definitely want to apply survivalist to me or survival instructor. So I've kind of accepted that a bit, but with a lot of caveats that like not survivalist. I, I would agree. You got, you have many caveats. Um, and your book is very, uh, it's very inspirational. And I want to, right before I get into that though, just for the listeners, how did you, like everybody has a backstory. Um, so what's your, what's your backstory? Because like me, I can't ever imagine that I would want to go, camp, I'm going to call it camping <laughs> for, for 73 days straight, right? Like that's, I have different interests and things like that, but that, that is right down your alley, right? So what is your, how did you become you? Yeah, wonderful question. So I definitely grew up as someone who spent a lot of time in nature. Both my parents were hikers. My dad was actually an endurance runner running 100 mile races. So I spent a lot of time in the wilderness and out on trails as a kid. And then at the same time, I also was always really driven to make and do with my hands. I started, you know, making clothes for my Barbies and crocheting doll clothes and and then making my own clothes by the time I was a teenager. So I always had the drive to make and do. And as I grew up and found that I was just absolutely fascinated, not just by spending time in the natural world, but studying it, studying biology and botany and ecology, that the ancestral skills were kind of the natural merging of my desire to make and do and to know and apply knowledge about the natural world, because you need that when you are harvesting material to make a basket, you know, understanding what allows you to make a waterproof basket rather than just a carrying basket. It's it's an integration of the skills to manipulate the world and to understand deeply the ecology and all of the patterns and all of the nuances of the plant and animal world. So when I was first introduced to ancestral skills, it was just like coming home. It was like everything that I was born to do. And it was just such a natural fit that I never looked back. It's been the focus of my life ever since I was 19 when I first got introduced to some of these things. And that served you so well, because I got to tell you, you're, well, you already know this, but you're so courageous because if you told me that somebody was going to drop me off in the wilderness until I tapped out the first, and, 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 and if I agreed to it, the first thing I would do would be like, oh, I got to go buy some really nice gear. And, and you made your own, you made all your clothes, like you put all your skill sets to use and you made your own. And obviously it served you very, very well. Yeah, as you read from the book, I really considered whether it was a good idea to trust myself and all of the skills I've devoted my life to versus do what everyone else did and buy the fancy gear and the high-tech materials. But I told myself, well, I mean, I know that it's possible to live out there in natural materials because that's what everyone was doing prior to 100, 200 years ago. And I also really wanted to go out there as myself and bringing high tech fancy things wouldn't be in line with who I am. And I, I, I thought that it might be a handicap. I thought it might limit my stay, but I decided I'm going to go as myself or not at all. And then it turns out it wasn't a handicap at all. I think I was warmer and more comfortable than everybody with the fancy high tech stuff out there. I, no, it's, it's so impressive um, just to even have a skill set that you can like live off of like that. Uh, like for example, I mean, I mean, I don't know what you know about me, but I'm, I'm, I train people how to how to move, how to exercise, which is I love it. It's so much fun to like help people discover what their bodies can do. But I don't know how I would use that 
<laughs> well, that wouldn't even be a needed skill if we were living like our ancestors lived because they'd be moving and using their bodies the way it was be designed. They're designed anyway. Everybody would be born with the knowledge of yes. how to move comfortably in your body and do the things you need to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So, like, I would, I would be like, well, I, I don't, I, I would be out of a job. I'd be uh, just, I wouldn't be able to make my own clothes. <laughs> I'd have to learn some whole new skill set. Well, but these days it's really important. I mean, and I'm uh, similar to you. I'm actually really fascinated by physiology and exercise and nutrition and, you know, recognizing that our first and most important tool is ourselves, our bodies and our minds, and really putting time towards developing those rather than what most quote survivalists do, which is buy that fancy survival knife with the compass in the handle and the, you know, 12 different things that it can do um, and putting their faith in some gadget rather than themselves and their body and their skill set. So I think that you and I could could do some really cool things with teaching these skills. I would definitely follow your lead on that. Um, so your story is uh, never alone. By the way, the cover is, well, it's just, that's just an awesome cover. Um, Thank you. But I know just, I was like, do I go with the superhero pose for the cover yes. or do I go with something more <laughs> humble? But the reality is that it's going to catch a lot of eyes that might not be caught by the more naturey cover. So that my idea was to get it into as many hands as possible. Well, it was very well done. So that was good. Um, <laughs> but your story is a story of becoming. So I guess my first question about Never Alone is how long did it take you to realize that you were in the flow? And I, mm. I would even I would even call it the flow of abundance, but I don't. But anyway, like how how long did it take you to realize where you were at? You know, I really felt like I had to earn it, like the land was testing me and watching me. And I went out there with the intention to enjoy the heck out of myself. I had all of these routines. I'm going to sing the sun down every day. I'm going to have a dance party every week. I, if I'm not loving it out there, then I shouldn't be there. And the, for the first many weeks, I was going very hungry. I thought that I would be doing all kinds of fishing. I was fishing, but I wasn't bringing anything in. And I just was in a spot that had very shallow water. So all of the things that I assumed about the ways I'd be feeding myself, I also thought big game was going to be a strategy. And then I was out on this narrow peninsula without any big game. Um, so I... I think the fact that I maintained that attitude of love and gratitude to be there and giving thanks, even as I was slowly starving, I lost 21 pounds in the first 21 days, literally a pound a day up till the first three weeks. And then day 21 was when I got my first rabbit and I got that rabbit never having snared before, not having brought snare wire, having to improvise with my own hair and some parachute cord and objects in the natural world. And I caught a rabbit with my first snare ever. And that was the moment that everything changed. And I realized that it was going to be sustainable to stay out there and that the land wanted me there because I really felt like that wasn't me tricking that rabbit. That was an offering. I had no idea what I was doing and all of the odds were stacked against me. And yet I still got a rabbit with the first snare I ever set in my life. And so it was like, okay, I've now earned it. And the land tested me and I never wavered in being everything I said I would be out there, you know, being in gratitude, giving back to the land, doing everything that I could to show I was there with respect and humility rather than the urge to dominate and conquer. And yeah, that's when I felt like I was in the flow and life was going to work for me there. And I would be there for a long time. Oh, but buddy, let me tell you, you were, the land definitely wanted you there, but you were so much in the flow well before that happened. Like just, just the <laughs> fact, like how, how the show came to be, like all the doors that opened up for you to get onto the show. I mean, you were, to me, you were always in the flow. Um, since that felt true to me too, but I, I did question it when I then starved really hard for a bunch of weeks, you know? <laughs> so you're right. I mean, I felt from the moment that helicopter landed, I felt in love with that place and I felt that it wanted me to be there, but it really tested me with that extreme hunger for those first couple of weeks. The other thing I found really interesting, um, as when your story unfolds is that when, when to me, it's like the again, the flow of abundance starts opening up for you, you get these obstacles that come your way, like, like the strategy for the, the, the big game, um, but you, which you adapted to, right. But, but even before you got there, before you left, like you had the, the incident with your chiropractor, you had 
the incident, you know, your mom's accident, like you had so many, like the obstacles came. Um, because That's because you were sure. going to where you were supposed to be, where you belonged, and and like, but then the obstacles came. But you you overcame them. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I just had to really have faith, and I had to really surrender because. There were so many things, as you said, so many things that were in line that just showed me that it was absolutely what I was supposed to be doing. And every time a new obstacle and a new hardship came my way, I just had to kind of check in deep inside and be like, okay, like, is this still the right path? Am I being steered away from this path? And the answer always came back, no. But I started having a survival experience before I even got on the plane to get to the Northwest Territories. And that was actually part of what, I mean, it was an incredible challenge and it came with some some major physical issues like crazy cold sores and all these ways that the stress played out in my body once I was on the land. But at the same time, the summer and all of the prep and all of those obstacles had been so incredibly stressful that it meant that once I actually got on the ground in the Arctic in my location, it was a relief right? It was like the dropping of all of this stress. Whereas for a lot of people, that's where the stress really begins. So I felt in a way that that kind of set me up to appreciate the challenges of the wilderness a lot more than other people, because to my mind, they were so much easier to handle than the challenges I had faced just in order to get there. And a lot, a lot more details about that in the book. I'm sure we're being kind of cryptic here, but it's a pretty, pretty cool story all the craziness of the summer before I even arrived on location to alone. I did greatly appreciate how like chapter 11 was one of my favorite chapters, just because like the, the things that were coming against you, I appreciated how you did not accept a curse though. And, and to use your words, you decided to trust your body. Um, yeah. Which, was which huge. is huge. Yeah. And that was a lesson that I continued to apply all my time out on alone, like choosing not to eat some of the quote survival foods because my body had a real strong no. And then talking to people afterwards who had been out there, like my friend Nathan, who ate some of the survival foods and they did not go well for him. He pushed his body against what his body was telling him and he got real ill because of it. And I just trusted my body implicitly and let it take the lead. And it did amazing out there. Yeah, and you did like I, I got to tell you when I was reading how you were deciding to whether or not you're going to drink from the lake without boiling the water or just go all in and you listened to your body and went all in and I was like oh that's that's a gamble <laughs> it was a gamble for sure yeah and some people on different occasions um, locations on alone have done that and it has not worked out for them I will say in Labrador the lake that I had access to was like brown water and I had seen otters swimming around in it. And that lake, I got a very clear, oh, no, 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 you do not drink this water without boiling it first. So I made a different choice in that location and I'm really glad I did. So I feel like it was, you know, it was a trust, but there was also a lot of intuition there and that kind of deep knowing. And it, it did well for me both times. Um, And I'm just curious, uh, you seemed like you did live off the land. Um, specifically you had cranberries a lot mm -hmm. and i'm i'm just curious do you do you eat cranberries today you know it's funny a lot of people think that i would never want to look at any of the food that i survived on out there again <laughs> but i love everything that i lived off of there is now like so near and dear to my heart i feel eternally bonded with every plant and every animal that was out there so yes and they're technically they're different than the cranberries like ocean spray that we would buy in the store. They're technically lingonberries, which you hear of a lot of in Scandinavia. They're the far northern berry, um, but I absolutely love them. I buy specialty lingonberry jam now just to keep them in my life because they don't grow down south where I live. Do you have a, for your 73 days there, um, do you have a favorite time or a favorite moment that was your like absolute the moment? Yeah, there, I mean, yes. And there were so many of them in different ways. I mean, yeah, it's hard to describe how intense and potent each of those special moments are when you're out there because every day is so similar. There's a lot of monotony. Um, so those special moments just stand out. But sometimes it was little things like 
like watching the lake freeze up before my eyes the very last night before I woke up to the ice, you know, crusting the lake. I dunked my hands down into the lake and I lifted it up and I could see the ice crystals floating around like glitter in there. And I was like, oh my God, this is probably my last time looking at this liquid water. And then sure enough, the next morning, like when are you ever that tuned in to those nuances of the natural environment, right? But your everything depends on them when you're out there. So little moments like that really stand out. Um, the most amazing night out there, which was really um, a crux of my life, is in the chapter 5,000 Sunsets. That night truly continues years later to stand out as an absolute highlight moment of my life. Um, and you get the details in the book, but one of the most epic things I've ever seen, ever experienced. And it was towards the end of my time. It was as my time was winding down and I knew it. I was starting to feel my body really tank, like my my muscles being digested. Um, and knowing that like your organs start being digested shortly after you start digesting your muscles. But I really felt like I could die happy after that moment. It was like such a pinnacle experience that I felt resigned to having to leave, even though I didn't want to. And to whatever happened next, I felt like it was all gonna be okay because I got that moment that night out on the ice. So just talking to you and just in reading your book, you're probably like one of the most appreciative, grateful, persons I've ever met right so how how was it like I my heart went out for you when I read how it, it was hard when you came back when you left it's really hard yeah yeah when people ask me what was the hardest thing about your time in the Arctic I usually answer having to leave because it was really heartbreaking did you like just reading your account of it it kind of like if I could imagine like being coming from another universe to just a strange strange planet it was almost like maybe you even had an outer body out of body experience when you were when you came back like you know I, I I've often heard about people that maybe they 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 flatline or they die and they had this amazing out of body experience and then they come back and then they're like well they <laughs> they were they were in paradise for a second and for you mm -hmm. you were you were living your dream yeah yeah, I really was. And I wasn't prepared for how hard coming back would be. You know, I, I, the show recruited me. I had seen a couple episodes because friends of mine were on it, but I wasn't an alone fan. It wasn't something I watched. So when they reached out to me and I decided to do it, I started watching all of the episodes and I saw how the vast majority of people out there, they're really suffering when they're out there and all they want is to come back home. And so I didn't even think about how hard coming back home would be. But for me, it was the opposite. I mean, I loved being out there with every fiber of my being and I never wanted to have to leave. But, you know, I also recognized that I would have died if I had stayed out and they weren't going to let me do that. So that was never an option for me. Um, but, yeah, I really wasn't prepared for how devastating leaving that beautiful, pristine, I mean, the most remote wilderness, the most gorgeous, intact ecosystem I'd ever gotten to be a part of and to feel loved and integrated with that land. And then like the first thing I experienced to be trundled, you know, away on helicopter and then into a plane and then flown to the ER and eight hours in the emergency room under, you know, fluorescent lights and people coming in with all kinds of terrible things going on that are really diagnostic of the modern world and how hard it is on our bodies and our souls. So it was a really rough landing. And it, it yeah, I wouldn't go so far as to say out of body experience, but it was incredibly disorienting having that huge a contrast so quickly. It took yeah, me, it, took me a minute to catch up. It, 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 you, you described it well in, in the book because I, I, I could like, I empathize with you because even though I could never imagine being out there, all the adjusting, like the, the emotions, the tears, the just even, even the way you describe being in the drugstore with the lights, <laughs> like how the lights were shining on things and the colors coming at you. I was like, wow, um, that would be, <laughs> that would be, that would be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Really intense. So because of that, when you came back um, and you had been sort of, thriving you had been thriving for so long finding your food and 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 getting your calories when you came back and you were able to have food it took you a very long time for your body to adjust 
to food again. Yeah. How, like, did that, you're really good at listening to your body and giving in and honoring your body. How, was it hard to trust your body to, in its relationship with food when you came back? Or did it? Yeah, did it well, and my, bit? you know, I couldn't totally trust it, honestly, because most people, when they undergo deep starvation like that, so I, like, I was thriving in some ways, and I was bringing in food, but towards the end, it, I was definitely not bringing in anywhere near as much food. So I was definitely slowly starving um, and then much more quickly and actively starving towards the end. Um, so when you go through something like that, it's really hard to recognize the natural stop point. Like if you are allowed to, you could probably eat yourself to death. And that happened in earlier seasons where they didn't understand how important the refeeding program is. They would just take participants to the grocery store when they came out and let them fill up and they would gorge and then throw up and gorge and throw up over and over. People lost a lot of weight coming out because they, they couldn't, they, their bodies were so deprived that they couldn't actually trust what their bodies were saying. Their bodies are saying, you know, my body was saying, eat everything in sight as fast as you can right now. And I would have made myself really ill and you can actually kill yourself that way. Um, so that was really disoriented to go from like utter trust in the land, utter trust in my body and it's deep knowing to suddenly being in a position where you really are kind of like a child. You're being chaperoned, you know, you're having your meals prepared for you, you're being told when and how much you can eat. So to go from the most empowering thing you've ever experienced to feeling really disempowered and and like you you can't trust your body in that situation for a little while um was that was part of what was so 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 hard was like the loss of the most free you've ever been in your life to kind of the least free for a little while since you know since my entry into adulthood you wrote in your epilogue by the way i i typically don't like I usually read the book and if there's an epilogue, sometimes I read it, sometimes I don't, but I'm glad I read your epilogue because it's, it's actually my favorite part of the whole book. Um, the way I'm you glad you read it too. And I feared that I thought about calling it a different chapter, but I, I felt like it, it was so different it that it really belonged as an epilogue, <laughs> but I really didn't want people to skip it. So I was a little bit torn. And I was like, yeah, I'll read it. And then I'm like, oh, well, th I mean, it was, that was, that was beautiful like yeah the way you brought everything where a lot of the gold is it is yes it, it is a gold mine um so I don't want to give too much away in that but you have one sentence that I thought I thought was pretty neat um it's what would the world look like if we all knew the real value of food and gave our bodies only what would most nourish and fulfill us yeah can you unpack that just a little bit because that that was just strong for me yeah, well, part of that came from, you know, that moment, um, which I talk about in the epilogue, where I'm standing in a grocery store late at night, and looking around, and I'm like, wow, I just spent months starving, because I didn't have enough calories. And now I'm standing here, and I am surrounded by all of these calories, and most of them feel like poison. You know, it's mostly highly processed food full of terrible fats and sugars and sometimes fake fats and fake sugars that literally rob our body of nutrition. And um, just the idea that when you are out in the wilderness, food is everything and calories are everything. And you really understand the value of fat. And in the modern world, it is fat that is killing us, right? It is the overabundance of foods that is responsible for the vast majority of diseases. I mean, the overabundance and the, the wrong kinds of foods, foods that we never evolved to eat that didn't even exist until the last, you know, 50 to 10 years in some cases with some of these fancy fake fats and sugars and whatnot. Um, so just the idea that we've become so divorced from what our animal body actually needs and that we we eat for entertainment and we eat for sensation rather than for health and vitality. And there's nothing like almost starving to death <laughs> to really reveal what every single calorie means to the body and how beautiful life can be and we can feel when we're giving our bodies just what what maintains that that healthy vital system 
Um, so yeah, did that, did that yeah. unpack it sufficiently? Yeah, yeah. That was good. No, I, again, and I, I would love to really dive into that, but I want people to, to read all the gold in there. So I'm going to skip around real quick. Uh, chapter 12, also a strong chapter for me. Um, because you go, you, you come to the point where you're done rejecting abundance. Mm, mm -hmm. And again, yeah. to me, you were always in the flow of abundance, but I get, I'm not really sure you always knew it, but yeah, you're still in the flow right now because you've gone through this entire story. You've done alone twice, but you had this period when you came back and you were starting to readjust and everything and everything that the show alone set you up for, set you up for another, a, a world event called COVID. And I, it allowed yeah. you to continue to thrive to me. I, and so like, you're definitely in the flow of abundance. And it was, I think it's just neat when you realized it and like, you know, what, I'm done with the scarcity mindset stuff. I'm all yeah. into abundance. Yeah. Yeah. And really sharing that because I think our, our whole world, especially, you know, the modern Western world, it's all built around a culture of scarcity, right? I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have this. I don't have that. Um, and how radically transformative it is to shift from a scarcity mindset into the abundance mindset. And like I talk about in the book, you know, going through what I did makes you recognize that just having enough food to eat every day is incredible abundance that none of our ancestors had. So really shifting your mindset about what abundance looks like. And it doesn't look like a fancy Tesla, you know, and a heated pool and all of that stuff. It looks like just healthy food to eat and a warm roof over your head and somewhere soft and cushy to lay yourself down at night. That's like amazing to have those things. Amazing. <laughs> and, and maybe it's what you need when you need it. And it comes to right. you when you need it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Juanita, excellent story. Obviously, your life is now totally changed and you're on fire. Um, and Thank and you. you've, got, <laughs> you've got all these fans and all these people you're inspiring and and people are seeking you out. So if somebody's listening, if somebody's living in a, a rock under a rock like me, and they didn't know anything about a loan <laughs> or your book, but now they do. And they wanted to learn more from you. What could they do? Yeah, wonderful question. I have so many different ways to make the things that I do accessible to folks. I mean, I'm on social media. I'm on YouTube. Um, I also have all kinds of online classes, and I also teach in person, although I will say I've been doing a lot less in-person teaching since focusing on writing the book and then doing the book tour, which has been my whole summer thus far. Um, but also one of the really wonderful ways that I love and really feeds me as well as allows me to see the real impact and positive change I'm able to make in a lot of individual lives is my Patreon membership. So I have a membership on Patreon where folks join me and there's a bunch of different tiers with different benefit levels, but it's as little as $5 a month. And for that you get, we do a regular Zoom call every month where we check in. I'm doing all kinds of posts and, you know, skills related stuff and a lot of just what I'm up to and kind of the, the inside look at what I'm up to. Like, for example, I was running the maps for the book by them from the very draft stage so they could see the whole process. And I was able to share early chapters and they helped me decide on the cover and all of that kind of thing. Um, and it's really turned into what started out as just like support my work. And it's grown into this really beautiful, supportive community of like-minded folks where now like on my book tour, I got to meet several Patreon members for the first time who I've seen on video on our Zoom calls for you know years, some of them. Um, and we've really built these beautiful relationships. So it's this kind of beautiful community that we've built um, where we have a closer connection than I'm able to have with people on social media or my classes or that kind of thing. So lots of different ways to connect with me. And my favorite one, because it's more deeply personal, is Patreon. Awesome. And for if you if you could impart just a little bit of wisdom to somebody listening that maybe they don't think they're capable of, they could never, like me, I could never go out in the wilderness and survive more in a week, or, or maybe it's just something, another area in their life. Um, how are people capable? Like, could you, how, how could you help somebody realize what their potential is? Yeah, well, part of why it felt so important to share my story and some of my background too, is, you know, I was, 
a small, insecure, wimpy, bookworm only child. You know, I never believed in myself. And when I was first getting interested in wilderness skills, you did not see women in that world. You saw Rambo. Those were the examples you had. So I didn't feel like I was capable. I didn't feel like I had access to this stuff. And even with all of my devotion to the kinds of skills I used on alone, I had never been out in the wilderness living all wild for longer than nine days and never in the wilderness period, modern gear or no, for longer than like 14 days at a stretch. So I really didn't know until my first time on alone that I was capable of everything I did. So one of the most important lessons of my journey that I try to share is, you know, don't sell yourself short. Don't think that you know what you're capable of because until it's really all on the line, you don't know. And most of us are capable of far more than we ever give ourselves credit for. So just do yourself the favor of believing now that you're capable of more than you know, because you might not ever be in that situation where push comes to shove, but when it is, I think that most of us would really step up. So let's do it right now in our daily lives. You're a real badass. Can I say that? Is that okay? Oh, thank you. No, you are. And I was you hoping, know, my thing is, I, I don't want to be put on a pedestal. I want to bring everybody onto that pedestal with me, right? Like I wasn't, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not a superhero. I am fully human and we can all be more fully human and let's do that together because we were never meant to be dropped in the wilderness to do this on our own we were meant to do it in community we're meant to do it in in small cooperative groups so let's apply some of that in whatever ways we can even in this weird modern world we're living in awesome can i ask you one more question of course <laughs> i ask this from all my guests but i have no idea what you're going to say sometimes i think i know but for you i have no clue do you okay. like peanut butter Um, I do like peanut butter. I try to lean more towards almond butter a lot of the time, but I grew up on peanut butter, you know, so I still have a soft spot when I was actually, I write in the book how I was vegan at one time when I was vegan in college and like really starving because I'm such a born carnivore. I, I, God, I don't even know how much peanut butter I went through, but it was like, it was my, my meat at that time awesome. so yes so between almond and peanut butter either one creamy or crunchy uh usually crunchy yeah i like a little texture in there and natural ground or uh otherwise Maybe oh yeah 100 like percent. like with the, with the oil that is a pain in the butt to stir in yeah i'm not i'm not a skippy person i'm you know i'm very health conscious and hydrogenated oils and all the stuff they do so that you don't have to stir no never awesome <laughs> Wani, this has been so much fun. If you're listening, do yourself a favor. Go check out the book, Never Alone. Um, you can buy it on Amazon or wherever Wani tells you to get it. Wani, where would you like to get it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Amazon is great. We've got Amazon dealers all over the world that sell it. So that's kind of an, an easy way to go to. But it's also on Barnes & Noble and um, what is it? Indie books and books to read and all the different things. And I have links to all of those on my website, which is woniatibo.com, which also have the, the dates of my book tour. So that's a good thing to keep your eye on if you want an opportunity to meet me in person and all of the information about my Patreon membership and my YouTube channel and my online courses and all of that is all on woniatibo.com. So it's a great resource. And that will be in the links and the notes of the show if you're listening. So you'll be able to easily find that. Um, Juanita, thank you so much for being on the show. This was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Tim. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now get outside and play.